morning from I would like to welcome you all to the second day of the 2023 IFIS MSU Conference on Indonesian Studies. Selamat datang untuk kalian semua. Welcome once again. I am Kenkani Poluan and it's indeed a pleasure to be with you all today. Uh, thank you for joining us again on this uh, second day of the conference. Uh, yesterday was fun and insightful with the opening session, documentary screening, keynote address, and all the other sessions. But I believe we are also very excited to commence this second day of the conference. Our distinguished speakers are here with us, ready to begin today's special panel with the topic Old, Broken, and New Promises, the Dilemmas of Kebangsaan in West Papua. And I would like to welcome all of our uh, respected speakers, uh, Camelia Webgannon from University of Wollongong, Australia. Um, and unfortunately, uh, Ronnie Karani uh, is not uh, able to join us today, but uh, we also have uh, Hatip Kadir from Universitas Brawijaya, Jenny Munro from University of Queensland, and Elvira Rupkambu from Chundrawasi University. And so without uh, further ado, we will now begin the uh, session, which will be moderated by uh, Timothy Daniels from Hofstra University. Uh, so I will pass the floor to you, uh, Mr. Tim. Uh, you may have the floor. Okay, thank you very much for those uh, introductions. Um, I'm also sorry that Ronnie wasn't able to join us, uh, but I'd like to uh, welcome everyone who's on the panel and for all of those who are attending this uh, special panel on West Papua tonight. Our panel is, um, has several serious concerns. Uh, first of all, we're concerned with some old promises uh, made by the Indonesian government and Indonesian society to West Papuan people. In the early 1960s, the Republic of Indonesia took administration of West Papua from the Netherlands. Right? It shifted to the UN, from the UN it shifted to uh, Indonesia. And the Indonesian government moved military forces into West Papua uh, in the early 1960s, um, initiated um, what uh, many West Papuan activists and, and also academic scholars from around the world call a fake referendum in 1969. Um, and so I think that's a very important place to start because I think it's, uh, a key promise, I think, in terms of Indonesia taking over control of West Papua, moving mil military forces over, forcibly incorporating the territory um, and its people into the Republic of Indonesia, seizing control also significantly of the resources. West Papua is one of the richest uh, resources in all of Indonesia. Um, and it contributes significantly to the uh, GDP, to the overall economy. Um, so I think all of that in the early 1960s and beyond, um, you know, especially forcibly incorporating West Papuan people uh, entails some significant promises, Right, and so since they uh, have been forced to become part of the Kabangsa on uh, of Indonesia, uh, in a sense, uh, citizenship has been forced onto the West Papuans through that historical process. Um, it entails some important um, promises, as promises to treat the West Papuan people fairly, uh, to extend human rights to them, to recognize their humanity and their human dignity. Um, and also to share some of those resources uh, equitably with the people of West, West Papua. So I think that, you know, that historical experience itself sort of issues forth a call for um, a commitment, right? A promise of guaranteeing the human rights of West Papuans. But in and of itself lies one of uh, our key dilemmas because in that process of seizing control of West Papua, it in itself has violated the human right 
of self-determination of Papuan people, right? So that's a key dilemma, right? We've got this commitment promise of human rights, but the process that has created that promise in itself is uh, a dilemma because it's violated the right of self-determination of us Papuans. Um, we're also concerned with some of the new promises, right? So we, so we have the title, Old Promises, New Promises, we're concerned with new promises that West Papuan people and West Papuan organizations have made uh, to themselves, to their society, to their futures, to their sense of nationality uh, and belonging. Um, and so that's very significant because some people will call a lot of their own actions and activities uh, forms of sovereignty. Right, even though they lack political sovereignty and self determination, uh, they still have agency and they're still actively utilizing it to address several of the concerns in their everyday lives, in their families, in their marga, in the, the communities, in the, the organizations. Uh, and so we're concerned about that, but I think there's also a dilemma in that because the um, there's a limitation to what we can call the practices of sovereignty, right? How effective are they? How sustainable are these practices of sovereignty given the perpetuation of the political domination by the Republic of Indonesia? Um, and so, um, you know, we want to discuss that, explore uh, this in a very academic way. All of our uh, panelists are uh, academics or researchers who have explored these uh, promises and these dilemmas. And I hope that sort of exploring in a deeper discussion some of their research findings and their experiences will help to shed light on uh, potential policy uh, changes. Uh, and sort of campaigns that the academic community and beyond can initiate to uh, support um, the West Papua people to help to improve the conditions of, of their lives. And so what we wanna begin um, initially is with some uh, short presentations. So each uh, panelist will be drawing from their own uh, research to discuss um, some of the particular issues that they've focused on in their research. Uh, so we're gonna go around with uh, hopefully five or six minutes of presentations from each of the panelists. And then I have a set of some uh, prepared uh, questions as well to further explore some of their research um, and to draw out some more implications. Uh, and then we'll move to more open question and answer um, for 15, 20 minutes or more at the end of the panel. Um, so without any further ado, I'd like to um, invite um, uh, Elvira uh, to um, present uh, briefly some of uh, her research experiences and some of her research findings. Elvira. Thank you, Tim. Um, so so uh, last year, I and my friends, if I can mention the name, Ngura Suryawan, Apriani, and Asrida, we did uh, we conducted the research in uh, a place, a regency called Bovendigul. So Bovendigul, particularly in a village called Aiwat. Bovendigul is, uh, it's worth it to mention that it's a regency in the southern province of Papua, which is highly impacted by the presence of corporations, especially the palm oil plantations. So basically what we did is we wanted to see the situation of the indigenous people's livelihood there. And uh, as we know that, um, the, under the presidency of Jokowi, Jokowi has uh, in, has uh, made promises about the development and the infrastructure development have been one of the massive uh, projects that have been conducted in Papua because it is believed that the infrastructure development by allowing uh, more corporation to come, it can like boost the economic growth and at the end it can bring the welfare to the indigenous Papuan because marginalization is one of the big problem in that contribute to the conflict situation in West Papua. So what we did uh, that I also need to mention that uh, on a lot of the document 
uh, report or the document, the development of documents of the development in West Papua, the government always used the terminology pembangunan berbasis adat or customary based uh, development approach. What we do is we want to test whether the development is actually being carried by respecting the indigenous knowledge or not. Uh, and we want to see the narrative of the indigenous people and how they perceive the development, how they see the changes from their narrative. So uh, there, were, there are so many impacts of the development and our finding, but I just want to mention several things. The first one is that it it is it can be seen that the infrastructure development that have been focused of the government, the presence of the corporation, this palace actually has failed to respect the fundamental rights of the indigenous Papuan self-determination. And what we can find is that it actually uh, threaten the survival of indigenous Papuans. I wanted to mention that when the company, the corporation came to this uh, regency for the very first time, the indigenous Papuans actually had a high hope. They believed that when the corporation came, they opened up the market vendors. This is a new economic opportunity for us. They had uh, such a high hopes. But when the market come, the pattern is always the same. The market come, the influx of migration all, all also come. The more people come from Java, from uh, Nusa Tenggara, from Sumatra, and they came, these people are not ordinary people. They came with their established capacity and network. The network that they built actually when the traditional market came and these indigenous people think this economic opportunity to us, the road came, the corporation came, but what we found is that there is ex exclusion because this migrant, they came with their capacity, their network, they built their own network. They can go to the, they build all the established network with the corporation. They can sell their things. And for us, maybe this is a small thing, but this is such a big thing for the indigenous Papuan who sees the market as their own place to boost their livelihood. So that's the first problem. Influx of migration, corporation actually bring uh, uh, also the changes and exclusion to them. The second one is that this policy actually has undermined the food security. And I think it's very important to mention about the food security of, of the indigenous Papuans. Most of the people in Bovendigo, they are very dependent on the rivers, big rivers as a provider of their water. But then after the impact, after the presence of the corporation surrounded their villages, they are really afraid to like use the water, consume the weather because they believe it has been polluted. And they can see there are so many changes. Uh, they can see the changes with the fish, with the stream, uh, so many, many, many things. And they know that this is not safe to use their uh, to consume their water from the rivers, and now they just depend on the water from the raining. Uh, that is sake, so, so uh, to the, if we talk about the sustainability, uh, it's it's had already threatened the food sovereignty of the people. The third thing that I also want to mention is also about the impact of this development towards the indigenous women, which is really important because when we talk about the indigenous women, the regeneration is on in women's. So uh, women's, women's are actually, are I will say that highly impacted in a very negative way. We know that they are living in a male dominated society. It means that when the men, they want to make a decision about, they just want to give their uh, land to them, to the corporation is, the, the, of course, it's uh, a main decision, not a women's decision. But the thing that I want to uh, mention is about the situation of the women's health and reproductive uh, situation in, in there. So in Bovendigo, especially in the place, some uh, of, the, uh, of the villages that we went, uh, women are still give birth in the forest, even though that the government has like built, you know, Trans Papua Road, which is which is all the government all keep telling about how big, how good is for the people, but we do not, we do not need like a very sophisticated research to see that this this road is only for the to 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 serve the corporation uh, interest, not for the indigenous people, because these indigenous people they actually live uh, kilometers just in an isolated place without access to transportation, access to road. And they're actually surrounded by many of the palm oil, oil, oil corporations.
operation there. But women there, they don't they did not have choices. They can they can give birth, but they do not have hospital inside their villages. If they want to the villages, they have to go like uh, 30 minutes and they have to pay for like 10 to 20 dollars to go to the uh, to the nearest uh, healthcare center. So what happened was women still give birth in the forest and from like 20, 20s women that we met, most of them, 90% of them have experiences miscarriages. Most of them have experiences uh, death of their kids uh, at the age of under 10 years old. And I think we need more research to see how bad the situation is. And I'm talking about a, co a, a village, which is just a few kilometers from the corporations and from the Trans Papua uh, road. So, um, but by just uh, giving this uh, very short presentation, I want to say that the policy that have been, the promises that have been given by the government, I mean, it's it do not, uh, it, it's, it's clearly that it does not respect the self-determination of Papuan people. Uh, and also that uh, all of this development thing, it neglect the participation, it neglect to recognize the existence of the indigenous people, the existence of their knowledge, the existence of their uh, existing practices that they have even before the Indonesian government have their own independence, the existence of these indigenous people already there with their own management of their natural resources. So uh, to sum up, I will say that uh, the relation between these indigenous the women, young people, people relate their self, their land, their resources. It has been oversimplified by money, by economic incentive, by the word development. And also because of the stigmatization of these people that they're traditional, they're Papuans, they're backwards. And it, it has, uh, st uh, this stigmatization has disempowered them and has neglected their full participation or development. And it can be seen clearly in the, in, in the case of Bofendigo. Uh, Tim, I think that is uh, my short presentation. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Vera. You got us off to an excellent start. Um, I definitely have some follow-up questions about your, uh, your research. Um, but let's uh, continue with moving around our round table to Hatib, who also has some interesting work uh, development related. Um, Hatib. Okay, thank you, Tim. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my current research is in, uh, in Sarong. I'm uh, now doing research with um, uh, Professor Anna Singh on um, urban the history of urban uh, infrastructure in Sorong. Uh, this is a, a interesting uh, town where Sorong is basically built by not by the state by but by the private uh, oil company which is called NNGPM. Uh, the NNGPM uh, is based in the Netherlands, but mostly uh, the what is that? Uh, the, the finance uh, is is. Uh, the operation is owned by uh, General Oil from the United States. But uh, what interesting was um, since NNG, GG, NNGPM gone because in, uh, uh, Papuan was integrated into Indonesia and then all of the uh, NNGPM assets are uh, taken over by uh, Pertamina uh, or Indonesian National Company. And not only the oil company that is owned by Pertamina, but also the land. So we can see in the Sorong now, uh, most of the land in, in Sorong basically uh, dominated and owned by uh, Pertamina. So uh, most of the private uh, investment in Sorong, like hotel, bridge, and then uh, uh, what is that, housings, they ran to the uh, to Pertamina. So we can see that this is an interesting uh, town built by the private uh, company, not by the state. So you can see that uh, basically uh, at the first time in 1950s, uh, the way of uh, Dutch uh, C. Sorong is uh, uh, is like uh, what uh, uh, Richard Wolf uh, calls as a terra, nul terra nullius or em an empty land where uh, the Dutch came and then they just compensate uh, uh, the indigenous Moi, uh, uh, Papuan indigenous Moi who lived uh, in, in Sorong with um, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, um, uh, goods, commodities, and materials, and etc. So what I what I found during um, my research is that uh, this kind of terra nullius uh, mentalities uh, continues until the uh, when Indonesian integrated into the 
the uh, when Papua integrated into the Indonesia, uh, the kind of terra nullius continues to the Lysis fire uh, where uh, settlers uh, who uh, come to uh, Papua at the first time was boosted by Indonesian government project called Transmigration. But then, so what I found since uh, transmigration project stopped in uh, in the 2000, as uh, I'm I'm picking, picking back uh, what Elvira said that uh, the settlers came, the spontaneous migrant came, even though even the uh, transmigration uh, project stopped. They follow all of the money, all of the uh, finance uh, during the. Uh, uh, since the special autonomy, the government give uh, a, a lot of money. Uh, Indonesian government give a lot of money to uh, local government. Uh, but then uh, the one who got the advantage of the of this develop, urban development in Sorong is these uh, uh, settlers. So what I found uh, my tentative argument is that this is no longer a, a state-led colonization, but a settlers-led colonization. These are settlers or spontaneous migrant that uh, who take all of this uh, uh, physical infrastructure, all of this uh, development uh, uh, in Sorong, uh, uh, they get a, a, lot, uh, a lot of projects. And 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 when I uh, met the settlers, and most of the uh, reason are about the same, uh, based on the their risk taker, their uh, um, what is that very individual uh, self reliance, uh, and and they argue that. Uh, the reasons why they moved to Papua is because the wage is higher than their origins, like in uh, Nusa Tenggara or in Java. So this is very lysis uh, based on the economic, the way they see it's like um, uh, uh, this is the continuation of uh, Terra Nullis. So, um, um, so um, what I see in Sorong is that the continuous of uh, infrastructure uh, creates a feeling of ambiguity uh, since the spatial autonomy, the infrastructure is uh, is everywhere. Uh, specifically, uh, they extract uh, the government extract the sand uh, from the hill, and then extract also uh, uh, put the investment of oil in 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 Kabupaten of of Sorong. So um, uh, since I'm I'm starting from the zoom in research by seeing the how uh, the obsession of the of the settlers and uh, Indonesian government to uh, build of the uh, of Sorong of the physical infrastructure by what they often call as timbun. Timbun mean uh, stock filling or, or compacting the land because Sorong is actually a swampy area, and then they uh, put the the timbun, they compacting the land, uh, the swampy areas to build the the hotels, the housing, and and and. Um, uh, to build many uh, uh, kind of a massive infrastructure, uh, which uh, uh, basically the 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 work of timbun or or compacting the land had an access to the to the environment. So before I'm talking about the the natural access, the the process of uh, timbun or 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 selling or ex extracting the sand from the city uh, also causes the uh, fighting among the margas in 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 Sorong. So the story, the story is not since my research is in the urban area. The story is not about the uh, indigenous Papuan against the oil palm or against the the uh, the the com companies or corporations, but, but more on the fight between the margas like uh, Marga also and then Kalagison and then and Kalami. Uh, these are indigenous people who fight to get the land uh, because they see that their land. Has a soil which can be extracted for building the the city, for uh, compacting the land, the swampy areas. So this marga then fight in the in the court, and and it's create a, a each of the marga compete uh, one another. That's the social effect of the of the what I call as a, mm -hmm. a, a a new kind of uh, terra nullius or new kind of uh, wealthness. Uh, Kaliaran Baru uh, that this happened uh, after uh, uh, during the the special autonomy and then the second one is that uh, the uh, this is the access of the uh, access of the infrastructure uh, where uh, uh, the flood chronic flood now uh, is is coming uh, uh, and even worse in Sorong like happen uh, uh, each of the uh, of the people who live in Sorong that I asked they uh, suffer with uh, 
with flood or inundation, water inundation uh, in, uh, uh, let's say in every year, they uh, suffer with uh, between 10 to 15 times because of the because of the sand extraction that is happening in 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 the hill so uh so this is what is that what i what i see the the flood not only uh uh hit to the to the indigenous people absolutely they also hit to the settlers housings where the settlers housing also um so uh, protest to the local government so what i found this is a new kind of um uh wilderness are, are, are not alamli are, are this is kind of like a clearan baru that is happened in in sorong where uh, uh lies this fire where the government doesn't uh, take uh, really care about the welfare and then all of these settlers and indigenous people try to compete to the space and then they finally they the the urban areas hit by the flood and then they protest to the government and and etc so uh, this new kind of uh, timbun, the obsession to the timbun as a uh, uh, signification of the uh, referring to the modernity, compacting the, compacting the land is a part of the modernity. You, you, so, so you no longer live in the, in the swampy land, uh, in the rawa-rawa, in the mangrove area. So by compacting the land, so the land can be certificate and then it can be sold to the, to the, uh, to the, to the consumers. So, uh, that's what I, what I got so far, uh, 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 basically. So we need to take into account what is the excess of the uh, physical infrastructure that is obsessed, built by uh, the government. Of course, uh, the physical infrastructure also, as Elvira said, that it has a two phases uh, of the first, it's, um, uh, it, it's bring, uh, it's bring the, uh, uh, what is that access to the to the people but the question is that uh, what is the risk what is the access of the infrastructure and then the question is that to whom is the physical infrastructure is addressed and who the who got the advent who get the advantage of the uh, of this physical infrastructure thank you mm -hmm. thank you very much Hati. Uh, very very interesting uh, research uh let's move on to Ginny. Uh, to share some of uh, her research. Thank you, Tim. Um, yes, so I'm already distracted thinking about what Elvira and Hatib have been saying. Thank you for an interesting um, presentation so far. I also just made a couple of notes so that I don't take too much time, but I don't forget something I wanted to say. Um, so I think, um, yeah, so like, I guess a bit like Elvira and um, Hatib, my perspective comes from kind of a local, local research and um, research in Papua and um, first in New South, in North Sulawesi, going back about 20 years ago is when I first did some research with Papuan students who were living in North Sulawesi. Um, but so um, I wanted to start by talking about a collaboration that I'm involved with at the moment with researchers from Universitas Papua in Managuari, particularly um, Dr. Els Katmo, Yusina Wambro, and Yafid Sufi. And this illustrates some of these kind of new old um, broken promises or dilemmas. Uh, so we have this project together to design HIV education for communities that involves elders and customary leaders. These are kind of groups that historically haven't really been involved in HIV prevention. So when the team went to one village in West Papua, last year, about five hours or so outside Manakwari to talk about the local situation. The first elder that they spoke with said something simply like, humanity today is broken. So we're already off to a very, you know, <laughs> sort of um, depressing start to the project, um, but certainly reflecting the seriousness. So in the same village, some of the older women talked about how the knowledge from the older generation hasn't been passed down since the 70s. Um, including knowledge about the body, relationships, what it means to be healthy or not, food, um, spirituality, um, and sort of local gender values about what it means to be a good man or a good woman. Um, and this area, this village is not in one of the kind of areas of military operations. It's considered to be a relatively peaceful area, doesn't have a huge you know, company or infrastructure um, or settlement of, of non-Papuan migrants happening um, so this is kind of also, you know, the situation in other parts of Papua um, is also, um, you know, difficult. 
Um, so this um, in the capital, in the district capital, the uh, the government department of women's empowerment talked about a long list of problems that they're experiencing. Um, contributing to HIV prevalence, including things related to COVID, um, including like over the past couple of years, a lot of the education and outreach, even like record keeping and some of the HIV testing hasn't been going on. Young people were often not in school due to like, you know, um, public health restrictions. And so social crises deepened in many places with more alcohol and conflict and unprotected sex. Um, and even before COVID, you know, Indigenous leaders working on HIV in Papua said that their work was to save their people. So they really saw that this was a serious threat to Papuan futures. Um, so I guess a point from that, which sort of picks up on something Ira already said, um, was just that people know obviously very well and can articulate what problems they're facing, both historically and, you know, recently. Um, but their expertise is not widely accepted or actioned by those who have power funding authority. Um, there's very serious crises in Papua, and it would be good to see this receive more kind of scholarly and practical attention from those who um, study Indonesia. So I think that in some ways, that maybe this lack of attention and lack of engagement with Papuan knowledge and circumstances relates to those broken promises of reformasi, both in terms of improving Papuan lives and Papuan empowerment. Um, I think it shows that there's a lot of relationships that need building and restoring. But I also want to say that the lack of interest in local solutions is not just a kind of Indonesia Papua problem, but it's a global problem. Um, and in HIV, we see this, that the prevention in Papua has changed into what they call like case management, which is very like, I don't know, prescribed and technical and you need formal qualifications. Um, and um, it's mostly focused on getting people to do testing and treatment um, and a lot of admin and like getting people to, you know, meeting targets and things like that. So, but this isn't really working very well. And um, the current data from other sources says that many of those people who start um, antiretroviral therapy don't stay on it. So one statistic I read was that in January 2020, only a quarter of people um, in Papua, whoever started um, ART, we're still on ART. So there's a big, you know, situation where the global um, supposedly kind of gold standard or best practice is also um, not taking into account local um, perspectives. Um, and so this, yeah, this is obviously a kind of old global and um, broken promise. Um, but to, I guess, maybe turn to more positive um, things, um, as part of the same HIV project, so we um, started hearing about some of the responses and the solutions that um, local communities are coming up with. Most of them have had very little support from anyone internationally or nationally, so they're just coming up with their own answers. Um, and so elders and church leaders, teachers and young people talk about, you know, how they um, understand and practice health. Um, from young people, it was interesting to hear about the idea that being healthy means like having good relationships with their parents, with other relatives um, and the environment, um, looking out for each other, especially like younger siblings and children and generally like taking care of others. From some of the male elders, we learned about a cultural education program that they call Sekola Adat, um, that they're rejuvenating for young men. So it's based roughly on male initiation rites and processes that have changed a lot since the arrival in this area of Catholic missionaries in the 1920s, the Dutch colonial government in the 1950s, and the Indonesian government in the 1960s. Um, historically, initiation was a time for young people to be educated about all aspects of culture and survival, food and gardening, land, gender, ancestors. Um, and the women elders today also have initiation rights that they would like to revitalize for girls and young women to teach like a new generation about this kind of um, responsibilities and knowledge. So I think this could be a little bit along the lines of what um, Patim mentioned at the start about the kind of new promises that are not about the Indonesian state or global experts, but the kind of promises from Papuans to other Papuans working together to kind of restore um, health and 
improve their futures that could be considered these sort of practices of um, sovereignty. Um, so I guess I still want to add, though, that it's not really just about, you know, reinstating a past practice, but I think what I took from these efforts was about it just acknowledging how important cultural pride and revitalization is to improving and kind of understanding health. And so that means also like acknowledging how the government and missionary health ideologies and the healthcare system has perpetrated sort of ongoing um, damage. So for this, in this way, Papua can also be um, kind of a model to inspire maybe new discussions or insights um, in Indonesia more broadly, but about how like customary knowledge and cultural pride can kind of work together with medicine and healthcare um, and just, you know, to see what kind of new solutions will be, might arise. Um, but in order for it to, I think, um, you know, for that potential to be realized, um, I think we need to face and, I don't know, acknowledge more the challenges that Papuan researchers experience, um, particularly, and that includes, um, you know, just fewer opportunities in Indonesia, having their collaborations like restricted or monitored, um, facing heightened scrutiny. Um, I know that like foreign, you know, international universities have their part to play in this problem as well. I know of some that prefer to collaborate only with large universities in Java, um, for example, not with Papuan universities. And if they do work in Papua, they might like take their research teams from Java to Papua rather than work directly with a local um, university or team. So I guess I my thinking along this line was, yeah, sort of the new promise of future relationship building and collaborations that all academics can play a role in um, furthering and in doing so in like ethical ways. Because um, I wanted to also mention that um, you know, Papuan scholars and others have written a lot about the ongoing um, colonial legacy of Western knowledge production in Papua. So it's not just about having more collaborations, but having um, ethical collaborations. Um, and so this would extend to knowledge production in Indonesia more widely and beyond, of course, but doing more to acknowledge and sort of dismantle those legacies um, where knowledge has largely been written by outsiders or people trained in Western um, or colonial institutions that often repeat old stigmas or doesn't benefit um, local people. So I think those are, I guess, so maybe there's sort of the challenges of, um, of future promises. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll finish up there and yeah, look forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so far we've had three fantastic uh, presentations. Um, so let's move on to Kenny. Thank you, Pat, Tim. Um, three papers um, or, or presentations that will inform what I have to say. Um, so I want to focus in my opening comments today on just some of the preliminary thoughts that I have about faded and broken promises held out to Indigenous West Papuan women over colonial history, um, but also within West Papua by West Papuan men to women. So these broken and or unfulfilled promises have rendered, although not defined nor defeated Papuan women as quadruply betrayed. Betrayed, I argue, by Indonesian state apparatus, by a deeply patriarchal West Papuan culture, by Dutch attempts at gender empowerment that were truncated and by capitalist dispossession. And then I think in, in the kind of later rounds of comments, I can then talk about the renewed promises that are intended to fill the breach of the broken ones and also focus on the ways in which West Papuan women have and continue to practice sovereignty between these promises, um, enacting what I'm gonna call servivance sovereignty as a means of carrying out fulfilling lives in between severed and asseverated promises. So, when we look at Indonesian colonialism, and this is drawing on Pak Tim's um, introduction, Indonesia promised all Papuans liberation when it fought the Dutch for sovereignty over West Papuan lands. But as we know, Papuans and especially Papuan women have experienced scant liberation under Indonesian control over the past six decades. 
in 2017, for example, a research paper by the Papuan Women's Working Group and the Asia Justice Rights Organization found that four out of 10 West Papuan women had been subject to violence committed by Indonesian state authorities. And we also know that systemic racism towards women and health and reproductive services, um, which is a lot of, you know, around what Jenny and her colleagues have written about over um, past couple of decades, also in beauty standards and in advertisements and even in places where women are able to sell in the market. These forms of systemic racism are also ubiquitous. If we then look at the West Papuan independence movement, it also promises all Papuans decolonization. Yet it leaves little room for women's leadership or ideas about what decolonization should prioritize. In a deeply patriarchal culture, um, which Ira has um, mentioned, and one in which successive colonial regimes have infantilized and emasculated Papuan men, the movement aimed at delivering Papuan people from colonialism is a movement led by male warriors, warriors both in, in politics, um, in forms of leadership and in warfare. And um, Ira, if it's okay with you, I wanted to quote from um, an email that you sent me um, and Jenny about a year ago when we were having um, a conversation about this. And, and you wrote, Ira, that women rarely play important, an important part in the independence movement. Um, you said, I always feel that the institutions are too masculine and provide little or no room for women to be leaders. And even that the narrative of independence is limited to the issues of referendum or securitization. And I feel, um, Ira has said, that we need to expand the meaning of independence um, to the issues that you've just talked about in your comments, um, to issues of um, survival issues of food sovereignty, of sustainable livelihood of Indigenous Papuans, of high maternal and child mortality rates, and the marginalization of um, IDPs and exploitation of lands and other issues that are directly related to sustainable um, livelihoods of Indigenous Papuans. And you've said that by reframing the narrative and strategy, women will surely be included in this independence movement since the issues are not male dominated. And this, this um, highly masculinized independence movement comes from, um, you know, a, a patriarchal culture about which um, we see patrilineal, patrilineal lineage of adult land inheritance, which excludes women from decision making um, around what happens on adult land. Um, we also see that domestic violence and neglect and higher right. rates of HIV right. and sexual violence in the home and the community, um, uh, which um, all, uh, all of which are forms of violence that are regularly experienced by West Papuan women are uh, inseparable from the history of the power conflicts and the types of um, broken promises that um, I've talked about. Now, here I'm going into um, a discussion of maybe more of a faded promise than a broken promise, but in the early 20th century, Dutch um, missionary institutions promised a better life for West Papuan women through the introduction of schools specifically for female students. Um, and these were intended to break the shackles um, of traditional culture, of tradition and culture that impede progress, including that of Papuan girls. So this was written in 1949 about the girls' middle school opened by the Dutch. And many of the pioneers of the Papuan women's movements that have um, been really quite influential over the past couple of decades um, and, and still are, are graduates from these, uh, um, these schools. However, when Dutch um, uh, Dutch administration of West Papua was handed over to the UN, um, these schools were shut down. So despite Dutch attempts to uplift Papuan women by providing them with this kind of empowering um, education, women's political participation in Papua still remains minimal. Um, and these early forms of empowerment have failed to reach many Papuan women for a lot of the kind of intersectional um, reasons that we've looked at. And finally, I want to touch on how patriarchy, colonialism and capitalism have combined to disproportionately harm women, um, as Ira has mentioned, and promises from aggressive agribusinesses to provide jobs and schools and money are rarely followed through on from companies. They're often not agreed to by women. As women's rights activist Esther Haluk has averred, men are selling the land without consulting women. And then these broken promises from the um, from the businesses, from, from the plantations, from the agribusinesses, leave women more impoverished than men. And I want to now um, look at uh, just 
quote from some of the work or, or, or cite some of Hatib's work, Pak Hatib, Hatib's work in um, a recent article in 2022 and on a review of a suite of films featuring West Papuan women's voices, he gleans the intrinsic importance of gardens and forests for women and Ira and Jenny have um, touched on this too. And he writes about how when women lose forests and gardens, they lose a major source of food, medicine, spiritual connection, relationship development, creative knowledge, social and economic capital, and a site of cultural transmission. He And I quote, um, plantation companies have disposed women's belonging to gardens by using the customary power held by men. So once men's customary domination is hijacked by the capitalist interests of plantation companies, women experience double frustration. So I guess I want to end on saying that uh, these broken and faded promises um, to Papuan women, I've tried to pull them or you know analyze them from four different directions or having four different kind of causes but in essence they are all um, entangled and um, you can't really work on one without working on another but I guess in in um, in ongoing conversation in this panel I want to look at how new promises have come in to fill the breach thanks Okay, thank, thank you very much for four fantastic uh, presentations. And I think you've covered some of my initial questions uh, and for the sake of, of time and for opening up for um, questions from our, those in attendance, I'd like to move on to some other questions that I think the entire panel can respond to. And I think um, some of your research, I think some of the questions that I had about those can be explored, I think, uh, in some of the um, of some of these questions. Um, I'm concerned, I think everyone's brought up some of these assumptions about um, top one backwardness, you know, the negative sort of stereotypes and uh, portrayals of pop winds, um, even as they've related to the rhetoric around these dominant urban and rural development programs. And I'm wondering, um, as well as you know, uh, HIV education um, and issues with um, you know food security and so forth, and, and local uh, solutions to those sorts of problems. How can um, the use of you know, these sort of negative sort of portrayals of, of populists by the Indonesian government, you know, academics, corporations, uh, agencies? Um, how can we approach that? What kind of recommendations do you have, uh, each of you, uh, about how we can fix that situation? Um, and perhaps you can reflect on the role some of those negative ideas play in some of the development programs uh, and some of the work and activities of agencies uh, in particular. Okay, uh, I'll, I will start. Um, well, I think, uh, of course, that this stigmatization or the pop backwards is, we have to see that it's uh, deeply rooted in our historical uh, context related to the colonialism, system of racism up to now. And what I can see, but well, maybe I mentioned before that this uh, this, this, this stigmatization actually has greatly impact on how not only how outsiders look on West Papua, Papua indigenous Papuan people, but also when it comes to internalizing the policymakers, they uh, it implemented in a, such a very uh, I would say colonial col another colonialization in the in through the development. So the role of this, uh, it, I can see that the stigmatization have resulted in neglecting the existence of it was Papuan people and the jargon such as like stick um the Papuan people always consider as a traditional backwards people have been used as a justification to modernize us to to save Papuan people to to make Papuan people more human that that such a such a thing and it's really dangerous because it neglect the existence of indigenous people but also it disregard their knowledge their full participation it will deny their full participation in conceptualizing development and also in implementing 
supporting the development. And that is the big problem in Papua because like, for instance, like the infrastructure development is conceptualized mainly by uh, the, the thoughts of be, to modernize people, let's build the road. I wouldn't say that I'm an anti-development people. I'm, of course, we need development, we need roads, we need basic infrastructure. But when it comes to the like more exploitative uh, infrastructure or like Hatip asked the question about to, to whom, who actually enjoy this uh, infrastructure, that is a very crucial question to ask. Are indigenous people, have you do survey about whether indigenous people actually get the benefit from that? Or so many data that has showed how indigenous Papuan are marginalized, systemically marginalized, and that comes by our thoughts how we stigmatize uh, Papuan people. And we need, we think that we need to modernize that with this development. What is the solution? Of course, it's not easy because it's, it's, it's deeply connected with our history of colonialism and also systemic racism. But what I can think, I mean, we need to, our research, need, uh, our research when we did our research in both and what we want to, to do is we want to negotiate the paradigm of development from the government and also from the indigenous people. We hope that this paradigm can be negotiated. It can be reconciled and we can get how, how can we do that? Let's talk about it. Let's open up the dialogue. Let's see what the narrative of the indigenous people towards their self, their changes, how they think, what is the best for them? I think just leave the room for them to discuss about that and we can integrate that to the to the conceptualization of development. And I think the second one, uh, can, I, I know that the structural changes, can we cannot like expect that happen now, but I believe that as an academic, uh, as an academia, we also have a very significant role because we construct the stigmatization, we deconstruct stigmatization uh, against indigenous people. So we have to be extra careful, I mean, in doing the research on indigenous people or with indigenous people. We have to be extra careful when we do research about them because our narrative, our methodology, it can colonize them or it can decolonize them. It, it depends on us. So, I mean, as an academics, and I mean, it's, I also criticize myself about this. I mean, I have to think about how my research can really uh, can be used by I don't know policymakers, by other people, corporation. They can use my my research to to be uh, to colonize the indigenous people, for instance. So I think as an academic, that is our construct. We need to educate ourselves, and we need to think about how we will contribute to the indigenous people situation. Thank you very uh, much. Yeah, that's for me. Did, did anyone else want to respond to to that question? Um, Perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll Well, um, this this is um, just a really short um, input, but I'm wondering whether one of it seems like the United Liberation for, Movement for West Papua has um, has taken this um, by the head. This idea of you know you think we're primitive West Papuan people. Well, look at the state of the world that we're in right now. Look at climate change. Look at um, you know all of the the um, problems that have, um, you know, come about because of modernization and mass industrialization, et cetera. And, you know, what the, um, what we're going to do is if we get independence, we're going to have a green state. And so the ULMWP is working on a, a policy, a vision for a green state, which, um, you know, they're saying this actually isn't a new thing for us. Um, you know, if you think we're primitive, well, we actually, it, I mean, it, it's, it, it, the policy isn't a romanticization of the past. It's written um, in a way that brings in more recent literature on multi-species um, theory and the way that, you know, West Papuans have always lived in in relationship and in harmony, you know, um, with more than, with humans and more than humans and um, have, um, <clears throat> have lived in a sustainable way, being able to meet their own needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet theirs. Um, and so I think that this statement is a way of going, of, of challenging those stereotypes and saying, um, we're more progressive than you actually. And we always have been, um, to the people, you know, it, it, it's not, the statement, um, the vision isn't written like that exactly, but it is tapping into the kind of the discourses about uh, about how we need to live in the future. And it's saying, well, we prior to colonization always did live like this, so. Okay, thank you for that. Um, 
I think that in your earlier comments where you quoted ERA, I think you brought up some critical points and I'd like to get some responses to that um, in terms of the question of sort of reframing the patriarchy of the West Papuan, um, you know, predominantly male-led, um, you know, uh, Merdeka movement, uh, movements. And so um, what's been sort of, uh, how have the movements moved off of that? How have they moved to sort of embrace uh, perhaps the sort of intersectionality, um, the question of, of dealing with patriarchy, of dealing with some of the internal gender issues, uh, you know, domestic violence, uh, the position of women in production, in the Marga and so forth. How, what's the vision of some of the male-led uh, independents? Have they begun to reframe it? Uh, you know, perhaps this is for the, for the uh, entire panel. Because I think that's a very critical issue. And I think feminists around the world and the global South have been embracing it, right? There's an emergence of all these anti-colonial feminisms. And, and I think that, you know, that's what sort of came to my mind uh, when you spoke about reframing and sort of new visions. What are the visions of the United, um, you know, liberation movement for West Papua? Um, I've had some contact with the West Papuan Liberation Organization, working with John Ari, who's living in exile in the U.S. Um, and I've also asked him some questions about, about that, sort of pushing him, what's the vision for uh, gender for women? What's your, your, what, what's your sort of plan? You're dealing with the environment. Uh, but perhaps you both can uh, respond, well, not just, but also Jenny and Hati. Um, I like to have responses overall. Some of your reflections and what do you think is necessary? What have they embraced? Where do they still need to move to go a bit further to fully embrace, um, you know, these, um, uh, you know, intersectional dimensions for the needs of Papua and um, women? Ira, I, I don't want to, I have a few comments, but I would rather you speak because I was quoting you. It would be really nice if you wanted to expand. I, yeah, Kemi already quoted me really nice. <laughs> and I, even I forgot, I just, I stepped that. But, but yeah, um, uh, Tim, I mean, uh, of course, political independence remained the uh, very remain the consistent consistent demand since 1960s until now but for me i always feel like if we look at this the current situation of pop one i feel our struggle is actually is beyond political uh political independence i it's beyond that because i think that of west pop one what is really crucial is about the survival of indigenous pop one uh, because um this is a joke, but in Papua, they say, okay, now let's talk about Merdeka, but if we got this uh, political independence, who gonna be the people if people already died? So this is a joke, but it's it has a very significant meaning. People are now are thinking about their, their, their survival. They think about the, the land that have been taken, how can they feed their kids? I went to several places, did some uh, research, and I saw how many of the uh, high, highest maternal mortality rate, infant mortality rate in West Papua, how people, kids are not educated, how how uh, we have a ca high case of stunting malnutrition in, in West Papua talking about HIV and things. And I think when we talk about the, the independence, we have to reframing the narrative. We have to, how to think about this survival, the survival of indigenous people. That's now, that's now the, the, the most important thing. And for me, it's beyond political independence. For me, it's, it's something, it's about the think of, the existence of a uh, West Papuan generation, and and that's a, for me political independence uh, is resulted from when people do not think how can they imagine the future with Indonesian government. I think, and that's what they can think. They can think of having a new, 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 new country. They are having a new state. But for now, I mean, we have to see that the current situation of people now they they want to survive. But still, the political independence, the aspiration to be a independent set, it, for me, it's remained there as a political aspiration, as their ideal, as their goal. It's it remained there. But now their struggle for me is it's. it's it, how to survive that um, that's my, my opinion can i continue okay, uh, what uh, elfira said 
Um, so uh, back to the uh, to the first question. Basically, uh, what we need uh, to do is that uh, making a balance between physical and soft infrastructure. As you said, that um, uh, well, we can say that um, the the physical infrastructure in Papua is quite successful, quote unquote. Like uh, in terms of, uh, for example, building the schools, like in in Sorong, so the schools are everywhere. But who are going to the school, the students uh, in the school? Like if you see the uh, HDI, Human Development Index in, in Papua, including in Sorong, it's very low. Uh, the average years of schooling, like uh, 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 they call it rata-rata uh, lama sekolah in, in, in West Papua. Uh, those are mostly uh, the experience studying in school only like, uh, for, for example, young people, 25 year old, they only have an experience to study seven, seven to eight years, according to my uh, encounters with the young people in Sarang. So basically they graduated in SMP. So you can see the physical infrastructure is succeed. Uh, the government built, a, uh, like I say, as I said, uh, obsessed with Timbun, building schools, Tembok and et cetera, making a concrete schools, but no one studying there. I mean, like it's very low participation of students uh, 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 studying there. As a result, uh, Papan competition to the settlers, uh, they cannot compete to the settlers who bring certificate from like, let's say Sulawesi, Jawa with their uh, diploma, uh, uh, S1 or et cetera, while the Papuans, uh, the, the, what is that average years of schooling or uh, expected years rata-rata uh, lama sekolah is very low. They cannot compete in the, in the sector jasa or, 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 or what, what you call service uh, sector uh, that, that's why you can see this is a common uh, uh, general view. We can see uh, uh, from my experience in Sorong, I can I, I bet that also happened in Jayapura, maybe in Nabire, where all of the settlers dominate the the uh, working in the in the service uh, sectors. That's the first thing uh, we need to balance between uh, soft uh, uh, physical infrastructure and and a soft uh, infrastructure, and then. Uh, well, regarding with the stunting, for example, in my case in Sorong, uh, what government do still connected with my word of timbun and tembok, this obsession of building tembok, uh, making reclamation, etc. The 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 uh, Papan government built the uh, what is that uh, uh, the walls along the coast to block the water to block the air pasang because they argue because of the climate change and etc. As a result, people who live in the coastal areas and depend on the mangrove, like you can say like udang or kepiting or crabs and uh, shrimps and then et cetera. Uh, the water, talking about the environment, the, the break is water, the salt, and then turns to be fresh water. As a result, uh, uh, the what is that? The shrimp that usually, uh, uh, what it's feeding in the mangrove and et cetera, they don't go to the mangrove because of this, of the physical infrastructure because of this tembok and, and, and wall against the climate change and et cetera. And then uh, what I see in my research is that uh, what is that stream and 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 perhaps uh, getting smaller and smaller because the break is water gone. And then because the this is the, the, the obsession of uh, uh, Indonesian government to make the water from the breakage to the fresh water. As a result, the, the biota, sea biota smaller. And you can see, and I can see in my research, these people who live in the coastal areas, uh, they, malnut they, gotta, they suffer with malnutrition because of, the, of this fish stock uh, and, and a stream stock uh, decline along the time. So this is the thing that uh, what I uh, if if you refer to the to the uh, literature on infrastructure. Uh, so basically, uh, talking about infrastructure is not about building, but it all to do with the care and maintaining, care and maintaining that is often neglected by government because building mostly uh, is about more male stories, right? But while care and maintaining, which usually it's, this is a trope or a metaphor uh, taken care by the women usually, which is not. Uh, uh, being considered by government. So uh, caring and maintaining in infrastructure is also needed. That's, that's Thank you very much for that. Um, yeah. Definitely, I think that builds on the question of the um, of food insecurity and that problem. But I have some other questions to follow up, but I think we're out of, of time. Um, 
um, and we need to move to open it up for question and answers because I think we're going to get some fascinating questions as well from those in, in attendance. So if our MC would like to assist with uh, questions. Okay. Uh, yes, Tim, there are already uh, three questions uh, enter the uh, Q&A uh, sections. So I will read the first one. Uh, came from uh, Bernard Luesi. The question is, is there any possibility that uh, modernity or development can go hand in hand with uh, the protection of indigenous communities? Uh, this seems to be problematic even in Western countries as well, at least in the US. If there is such a possibility, uh, I wonder if you could touch some um, successful stories. Yeah, that's the first question thing. Okay, uh, I think that's a good question. Would anyone um, on the panel like to? Tim, maybe I can share. I can share some of our, uh, our research uh, last year in Kabupaten Jepur, Jepur Regency. I, I wouldn't say that's a success story, but we have to see which uh, area that want to be interfere. For instance, like in Bovendigo, it's highly impacted by the corporation, so it needs to really um, hard work there. But in Kabupaten Jepura, uh, so I believe that we can actually, like I said, negotiate, uh, negotiate how the development have to be conceptualized and implemented. So it's a, uh, in, in Kabupaten Jayapura, for instance, the previous Bupati, the leader of the Regency, uh, did, uh, made some uh, very good significant steps by uh, releasing uh, some of the laws on recognition, recognizing the indigenous people's land in the uh, indigenous people's status there. So there are some of the like legal, uh, what it calls laws or some of the legal foundations to to recognize the existence and also to recognize the 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 indigenous people in several villages in Kabupaten Jayapura. Well, it is really good because the government took that uh, steps. So, but what is uh, what we can see is it's really good, but the problem is it's not really being communicated effectively from the this bureaucratic level to the uh, on the level of uh, the community. So, in some of the it, it's some of the village, it's good that people feels that they are recognized now. Uh, but the problem is uh, when it comes to the implementation, I think it's still a problem because we have some overlapping between the national, provincial uh, policies and also the 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 policy from the the Bupati themselves. So, uh, I would I wouldn't say that's not really a success story, but I think that it's, it's good that the government can do that. Uh, and now we are still waiting for what happened next because most of the people put their hopes that it will be a, a first step that is taken by the, the government to protect uh, the, 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 the indigenous people there. So it's not really a success story, but I, I believe that it's a really good thing and it's widely accepted by the indigenous people there as a first step to, do, to protect themselves is it okay if yeah. I add something quickly in there? It's me, it's Jenny. Sorry, I don't know if you can um, see me or hear me. I was just going to add that. So in the space, in the context of HIV, at least HIV prevention and things like that, um, uh, maybe, yeah, I think there has been some success. I particularly want, there's a point in time, I think about 10 years ago, when some international organizations said to local NGOs and Papuan led groups, what would you like to do? What would work best in your village, in your city, in your, with this group of people? And sort of allowed people to, you know, a certain extent at least, to design their own community HIV prevention programs. And I think not only was there some success, some impact, it also helped to build a stronger collaborative kind of narrative around uh, working together to prevent HIV and sharing things that were working like sort of best practices that were local. Um, and I think, yeah, helped to build much more of a momentum towards these kinds of issues. Um, I think that that changed, unfortunately, and a lot of emphasis went towards the technical side of things and away from the community-based side of things after like sort of 2017, 2018. But um, so I guess I think that's maybe a way that 
that from a different angle, um, this can also, yeah, come about more of these kind of community defined local knowledge based sort of approaches. Um, and so we, yeah, we can all advocate for international programs and perspectives that actually are based on local, um, yeah, local ideas. Yeah, sort of um, building on that and sort of drawing on some of my experiences and research with uh, John and Ari um, in the United Nations, of course, if not major project now for the UN is sustainable development projects. Um, and so um, John and Ari, the founder of the West Papua Liberation Organization, his response to that um, is very similar to um, the response of indigenous groups in the United States. Um, you know, indigenous uh, groups you know, that are arguing for red power, they're demanding for there to be sustainable development. There needs to be some kind of reckoning with the issue of sovereignty. They need to have sovereignty. And I think some of your papers and your research sort of speak to that in terms of drawing on uh, local knowledge. Um, I think Cam, he said, you know, they know how to do it much, much better because of the relationship that West Papua and people have with the uh, environment is very similar. I think it was a very astute question to sort of arguments that um, indigenous Americans have been making, for instance, in some of the red power um, uh, movement. But it gets back to, I think, that critical issue, you know, is are these sort of dealing with these issues, do they go beyond the issue of, of independence and self-determination, or do we really need to reckon with that issue uh, for West Papuans themselves to provide and draw on their own, uh, their own knowledge? Um, but let's move on to the second question, and we may sort of, you know, touch back on some of those issues. Okay. Uh, the second question uh, came from Given Panri. Uh, questions on equity and self sovereignty patent contradict the Indonesian central government's rhetoric on unity and KRI, hence the lack of political will of non Papuans. Uh, what alternative narratives can be viable to encourage non Papuan Indonesians to decolonize uh, West Papua? Uh, what practical avenues can a non academic uh, average citizen can pursue? That's the question. Um, um, well, I have um, over the past probably 15 or so years worked with lots of um, Indonesian, some, some academics, but some non-academic average citizens. Actually, I wouldn't call them average citizens. They're phenomenal, phenomenal citizens, but um, who have taken on different framings um, to work in solidarity with West Papuans. So they might not necessarily, um, I mean, I see what you're saying with, you know, sovereignty and all of these issues, uh, all of this, this kind of terminology flies in the face of, of um, the NKRI. So they will talk about human rights framings. Um, or you know uh, maybe environmental sustainability, but I think human rights is a really strong one. Um, you can talk about indigenous rights again. That doesn't sit very well with um, the Indonesian government's claim that either everyone is indigenous in Indonesia or no one is. But I think you can um, you can use human rights to um, to then form partnerships with West Papuans working on similar things. There's a lot of groups in West Papua. I mean, Ira and, and Jenny and um, Hatib can um, vouch for this, who, um, or a lot of international organizations as well, working on issues in West Papua. Um, Papua I think framings around human rights and peace, um, even, you know, Amnesty International in Indonesia is strong on on human rights. Um, and I think those are some of the ways that you can get around looking at sovereignty um, or, or talking about, you know, independence or merdeka, even though, as Tim said, I think those are critical, um, cr critical and foundational terms that need to be spoken about at some point um, because they're not going away. Um, and there's a conflict that is becoming more and more entrenched around issues of independence or sovereignty. But if if those are not things that you want to breach and you still want to be, um, you know, an, an ally or work in solidarity with West Papuans, looking at peace building, peace, justice and human rights are um, framings that could be very useful. 
Yes. Uh, yeah. from uh, just a little bit, I think uh, we have to recognize there is a big problem about this. I mean, about the non Papuans, uh, how they look Papuans. There have been like a binary construction about Papuan. People will think if you talk about Papua, whether you're talking about NKRI Harga Mati or we talk about Merdeka. So it's like a, you just have to choose this political position. And the, 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 the problem with this binary construction is we're not going to look on the human rights things in Papua, we're not going to look at the problem of humanitarian issues because our minds have been internalized into these two binary construction. So for instance, when I talk about the racism and some of the uh, my colleagues from Indonesia asked me why we have to pursue uh, the, this, uh, this struggle against racism towards West Papua because it means that we have to be standing with you against uh, as a separatist to 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 push your the political independence of West Papua, and I think this is uh this is the, the biggest problem. We think if we talk about human rights of Papuan people, we talk about humanitarian problems of West Papua. It means we take side of this political independence thing, because our mind have been internalized, constructed into these two, two two areas of thoughts. So I mean, it's important for us if you want to be. I mean, I always want uh, non other Indonesian people to stand with us in solidarity, influence the policy makers, the political leaders to stand with us. But it has to be started with like decolonize our mind first that that we need to think and to see Papua with a more refreshing uh, perspective to see this there is a struggle of, about human rights in Papua, but humanitarian. So why? So there's no reason we don't, you know, be in the struggle together with Papua. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's my point. Thank you. Yeah, I think definitely, you know, the human rights sort of framing as well as an anti-racism framing. And I think Cammy's written some uh, you know, powerful work recently looking at how the anti-racism sort of, of discourse and rhetoric has galvanized the West Papua movement. Um, and it gets me to reflect on some of my, you know, ongoing friendships that I've had over the last couple of decades with many Javanese. Um, Indonesians, and I've asked some of them about um, the problem with West Papua, and they they have given that sort of response, you know, that we've they've, they've been indoctrinated with a certain sense of kabangsaan, of, of, of nationalism, and, and so forth. But they are, they do admit when I mention about Orong Hitam, and they say, well, you know, you know, looking at that eastern part of Indonesia, all those groups, Papua and the other groups, they're all called Negroes. And he admits that it's not uh, polite, right? The sort of knowledge that's connected to that uh, use of that category. Um, and so I think there's definitely some opening there for the development of an anti-racist movement amongst non Papuan uh, Indonesian. I think there's a serious um, need for it. Okay. I think we can move to the uh, third. And I guess uh, because of the uh, time limitation, this will be our last question from the uh, participants, uh, which came from uh, Margot Lederer for Hatip. Uh, Hatip, uh, the question is, I'm I'm very concerned uh, whether government, even provincial government is not focusing on developing education and uh, skills for the local population. Indeed, despite the technical economy and potential uh, for added value manufacturing by current precedent. They are not developing uh, STEAM, science, tech, uh, engineering, arts, and math schools for local youth, which will create a smart workforce locally. How can we convince uh, government to invest in new science and uh, technology curriculum integrating uh, local Papuan uh, knowledge? Yeah, thank you. Maybe uh, later other panelists can help me with these questions and um, uh, because uh, my research uh, focus is not on education, but I will start with the uh, with the one uh, uh, narrative that I got uh, during my fieldwork uh, in Sorong. So the spatial autonomy uh, or OTSUS uh, basically already implement the what is that uh, political affirmation and educational affirmation uh, in, in, in West Papua. And uh, so there is a good willing from government, but um, as a researcher, I see the messiness what happened in the bottom, in the ground. Uh, what I found that, uh, for example, for urban infrastructure, uh, it's uh, uh, for the 
uh, building the physical infrastructure, the budget for over two billion rupiah or two trillion to to dua miliar. So uh, the tender project can be compete among the Papuan and non-Papuan. But if the uh, uh, the budget for the uh, physical infrastructure is below one billion or uh, di bawah satu miliar, so it is appointed by the uh, sent, uh, by the city government. So the wali kota gave uh, uh, to the Papuan, uh, to the indigenous Papuan, uh, a civil engineer who can uh, who can build the the, the infrastructure uh, if it is uh, below one billion. But what happened is that uh, this non Papuan they put uh, the Papuan name on the on the budget on the on the project uh, that is below uh, uh, one billion because uh, uh, the the civil engineer uh, the uh, the developers uh, non Papuan developers who do not want to compete uh, for the for the project over uh, two billion they just uh, 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 go to the uh, one billion project by putting the uh, one indigenous uh, name. Uh, on that on that on that proposal so they they can get the the proposal so we can see all over in the city still the one who take care with the physical infrastructure are non papuan uh, i very rarely see the the papuan working on that except they're working as a in the as a tukang or uh, or what is that low labor uh, like uh, lifting up the pasir and etc but not as social engineering this is the education i mean like if if you if you refer to the to the steam uh this is uh, what i uh what i'm concerned is that we need to uh back to the my uh my command in the first that we need to lengthen the harapan uh rata-rata uh, uh lama sekolah so that the, the the papuan can have more opportunities in education and also can compete uh in uh, especially in the in the in the in the project in the physical infrastructure for example that's uh, uh so far that's I also admit that it, it is very important too to to give the uh, the more uh, uh, long average in schooling uh, or uh, extending the rata rata lama sekolah, which later can uh, they can compete with this kind of uh, competition in the especially in the urban infrastructure. Maybe uh, other panelists can add up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Jenny has done some research on education with. Jenny, would you like to? Sure, I have, but I was also thinking many of um, Alvira's points also relevant to this discussion that's, about, that's, that's you know, true. if employing local indigenous uh, business people in or STEM technicians, whatever you would call them, <laughs> is a priority in the local in the, you know, in the development area that's going on, then you would see that that could be happening. But because there isn't that full participation and you know, people being in a position to articulate necessarily what they want to get out of it and to get that fulfilled, that doesn't um, happen. I think that they're, you know, asking the question that you have asked is part of how it, you know, how to convince the government. I think there are those deep rooted uh, stereotypes that Papuans are not as, uh, you know, technically skilled or scientifically capable or even in business. Um, the job market is has always been, I mean, in big picture anyway, racialized with most Papuans joining the public service um, or working in, yeah, like doing, um, working in the local, selling things in the local market, um, particularly for women. Um, and the private sector has always been mostly non-Papuan dominated. So that's, um, it's different in different, you know, specific local areas, but I think that's a broad pattern. And so like there's, different organizations um, that are trying to change that and trying to promote um, Papuan business ownership um, and yeah, probably uh, improve some of the technical uh, training and so forth. But that's always been, the pattern has always been that even in the mining context that has been done by outsiders brought in to do that work. So it's about, yeah, changing the mindset of what should be Papuan opportunities and what people are capable of. Um, but I also agree that the, the education level itself in some areas is very is a really critical issue. And um, in a team project I was on, we found that um, young people in, this is when the south of Papua and a little bit further south from where Elvira was working, uh, young people also are 
not going to school because they're hungry, essentially, because they need to leave home and live in a dormitory and there's really no food. And, you know, teenagers, they eat a lot of food. And so these connections between food and schooling are a real important issue um, and having to move away from home for schooling in an area where no one's really taking care of you. So there's multiple, I guess, kind of answers and directions that could help to in, you know, change that situation in the future. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of our um, panelists um, for your participation. I think we're running uh, pretty short of time, but um, we have much more to discuss and, I, and I'm quite sure that this dialogue will continue. And I think um, uh, Megan and our organizers from, from APHIS will also uh, remind all of those in attendance and other people that the, you know, the, uh, the WOVA uh, sort of, you know, uh, link for making comments and raising questions and so forth is still active um, and people can continue to uh, post questions and comments. Um, and I think our panelists, uh, you know, feel, feel free to, to respond. Uh, but thank you to everyone, uh, for all of our participants, uh, and for all those in attendance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Terima kasih. Terima kasih banyak. Terima kasih. Thank you, uh, Tim, again, for uh, moderating such a fruitful discussion. And as you said, this dialogue might not end here might uh, continue further uh, later in the discussions. And moreover, thank you to all of the speakers, panelists for the interesting uh, insights and perspectives. Uh, and also to all the participants, thank you for your enthusiasm. Uh, and before I officially close um, this session, I would like to invite all of the uh, speakers, all of the panelists to uh, start your camera and we might want to take a picture together for a documentation for the uh, organizer. And I will let, uh, I guess, Yara will lead us in the uh, picture taking, I guess. Yes. Okay, thank you, Kat. Uh, I'll take the picture now, one, two, three. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Yara. Sama -sama. <laughs> Once again, thank you, everyone. Uh, with that being said, I would like thank, thank you, everyone. To end this special thank panel, everyone. and thank you. See you in the next sessions, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Really phenomenal discussion. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs>